Okay, so let me talk a little bit about the silent films of the 1920s and 30s. Normally, when people see them for the first time, uh, they're surprised by the content. They expect something very distant, uh, not connected to the present day at all. Uh, but then they're surprised that it seems to be some connection. And so probably the most interesting issue is migration. So back in the 1920s and 30s uh, in China, uh, there were lots of people, millions of people, who left the rural areas, left the villages, and were looking for a better life, new opportunities in the city. So if you live today in China, uh, or if you live in other parts of the world, if you see these films, uh, actually, it will seem familiar in, a, in an interesting kind of way that those people were going through a similar kind of process. Uh, they had hopes, they had desires, but then problems came up uh, and it wasn't clear how they would make the transition to the modern or to the global uh, and so forth. And it, for historians, this creates a very, very interesting picture. It allows us to understand the problems of today by looking at a more a historical context. This is the problems of today are not new problems. These are problems that have been experienced all over the world and in China itself. So the films then become very timely and very exciting, uh, very relevant. It's not some distant, uh, you know, ancient phenomenon. It's something that actually connects to our lives in a, in a very straightforward way. And I think there are many reasons for it. There's not a single reason. One of the reasons is, I think, commercial. That is to say, all of these film companies uh, in Shanghai in the 1920s and 30s were privately owned. The state sector was not involved in filmmaking activity whatsoever. And so, as a business, they had to make money. They had to make money. They had to sell tickets. Uh, and if the film was boring or visually not interesting, then... Uh, they might lose money on the... Uh, but I think there's another reason, and I think that the directors and the screenwriters, even though they're involved in entertainment, commercial entertainment, they also believed in their hearts that they were dealing with important social issues. And so again, it's this issue of transition to modernity. We want modernity, it won't be easy to get there, it's very complicated, we don't understand quite what it is, but we know this much, that the stakes are different for men and for women. So for women, when you're coming from a context of a patriarchal society dominated by men, women have more to gain in a traditional, in, in any kind of transition to uh, modernity. Women have more to gain. Their roles, their lives are going to change a lot more than men's lives are. And then the other uh, point that I talked about is this, what, what I call the politics of shaming. And so this is extremely important in the films. And so many of the women in the audience, and the audience is mainly middle class, poorer people can't afford tickets, rural people are never getting access to these films. So it's an urban middle class, upper middle class audience with education. Women can watch those female characters and say, you know, Jayo, Jayo, you know, go do it. Uh, you know, I understand what you're trying to achieve. If you're in, sitting in the audience in the 1920s and 30s, I've had some of the same feelings myself. I have women friends who have some of the same feelings or have done some of the same things. Whereas for men in the 1920s and 30s, watching these films could be a little bit different, could be embarrassing. In general, what I'm finding is a similar kind of pattern, uh, that, that the, uh, some kind of transition is underway from a pre-modernity to an, a modernity, although the modernity will be defined in different ways. In the Soviet Union, it's, they're trying to bring about a transition to socialism. Uh, so it can, it can vary, the kind of modernity, but it still raises the same issues for uh, uh, men and the same issues for women, many of the same issues. Uh, and another point that I make is the reason a lot of these films focus not just on women, but on the family unit is what we call uh, film as natural. 
national allegory. Uh, the story seems to be about a few individuals in a family, but actually these people are stand-ins for the nation. And so the issues they're struggling with aren't just personal issues, individual issues. You can read it that way if you want. And many people do, but also they meant to. They represent larger issues that the whole nation is going through, uh, and, I, and I find this not just in Chinese cinema. This is, in other words, it's not unique in Chinese cinema. But if you, the more Chinese cinema from this period you see, the more you realize that there's already a connectivity. Uh, even though each of these film industries tells us about that place, so Britain, America, I would make the same argu argument. You can learn a lot about America by looking at films from this period. You can learn a lot about Britain or the Soviet Union. So there's something local about it, but there's something also international and global. Finding these films, looking at them, thinking about them seriously would help not only international students coming to China, it would help the Chinese students themselves who don't know much about this. They think about today, they don't know much about 90 years ago, and I think most young people just assume, well, that doesn't have much to do with today, no connection. Well, I don't think that's true. Uh, so it can help anyone who takes a look at it. Um, and um, it, it just helps to uh, it, it, I think it's in some ways better than reading fiction because you actually see the people, you see their body language, uh, you, you, you feel their pain in a different kind of way than if you're reading fiction. Uh, it's, it's just a, a good way to uh, communicate uh, what I would call modern history, trends and currents in modern history. Uh, in other words, and it, this would be the same for any country. If you're going abroad to study, it's very useful. And of course, they, they come to China because they're interested in China today. Uh, Chinese students go to America because they're interested in America today. But they need to ask the questions. The China of today, where does it come from? The America of today, where does it come from? And so you need to go deeper into the past uh, and see the evolution of these places. Uh, and one way to do it is through these cultural sources, all sorts of cultural sources, including film. Mm -hmm.